Okay, we're gonna go. All right, uh, we're here. Where are we? We're at the University of Southern California. And what's your name? Jillian Max. And Jillian, now Jillian, what student group are you with? I'm with the moderator. It is a registered student organization, rather new, that just focuses on discussing polarized dialogue through asking questions to each other. Oh, well, that's a highly useful thing. How long have you been doing that? <laughs> About a year. Oh, okay. What year? What, and you're in what year? I'm a junior. And your major is? Global health. So why are you putting on this event? Why are you helping to host the event? Yeah, great question. So I would say given that USC is a large student population, we have an undergrad of about 16 to 20,000. Given that and the fact that students of different disciplines are pretty separated, um, both physically and within um, just interactions, I would say that there are definitely parts of campus that are more polarized and are more, as you would say, socially censored than others. For instance, uh, as a global health major, I'm within Keck's undergrad population. And with that, uh, there are different values than let's say Marshall or the School of Business regarding um, political ideology. Regarding what, what, what values would those be? And, and what, what so, it's, so before we take a step back, why yeah. are you hosting this event? Why is this important to you? Yeah, so to go back to why we're hosting this event, I, um, on behalf of the moderator, just thought it would be an amazing opportunity to have someone who is articulated and has expertise in the matter of asking questions and talking about these hard to talk about issues. Um, you know, in our case specifically social justice, but also in the larger context of just polarization. That's something that on college campus is very applicable because it is very easy with, you know, how driven we are by social media to get separated into our own beliefs and not have to see anything else. So that's why I thought that was really important. And we do this in our weekly meetings kind of similarly every week, but to really amp it up, have a bigger outreach, we thought that would be a great thing to be a part of. Cool. And have people told you there are just some things they can't talk about or ask questions about or don't feel comfortable talking about it? And if so, what are those, what are those things? Yeah, so I don't think I've been told explicitly that people don't feel comfortable about talking about certain things, but it is clear just within the presence of my organization's population who comes to our meetings, it's present in um, simple things such as mask mandates. Um, for instance, at USC, our mask mandate on campus was lifted, I believe, about three weeks ago. Um, and depending on the different school you're in, there will be a different percentage of the classroom still wearing masks. And a lot of it does relate to the subject in the classroom. For instance, I'm a global health major. In my um, health-related statistics class, I would say 90% of the class still wears masks. Um, we are also all uh, required to be vaccinated, but then I can go. Wait, to wait, wait, required. What, what happens if you're not vaccinated? You're not. You're not a member of the school anymore. What? No. So you are. We have exemptions. So there was. If you had a religious exemption or a exemption that you would like to submit for medical reasons, you were able to submit any of those to the school and get that waived. The condition, I believe, was that then you would have to test twice as often as someone who is fully vaccinated. So that was the workaround that the school came up with. So uh, what are you hoping to get out of the event tonight? What do you what do you want to see happen? Yeah, so I would like to see discourse happen. I would like to see disagreement, honestly. I think there isn't really a a lot of the time constructive enough place where that is allowed to freely happen and is allowed to happen in a productive manner. So I would really appreciate seeing people both voice their opinions, but also be keen on listening to the opinions of others, you know, really trying to balance that duality. Who, who do you think is, should come to this event? Like, do you think that there are certain people who this event could benefit? Mm -hmm. I think this, be this event could benefit truly anyone. I think my perspective has always been, you know, for instance, I'm a part of a, an organization that talks about a lot of political issues, but I'm actually pre-med. I don't have an interest in going into something like that career-wise. And I think at a school as academically oriented as USC, we kind of lose sight of, as humans, what is something we should all partake in? Totally. And I think this is something that is almost like a civil duty. Like we need to be able to be comfortable just totally. being around each other because just because I don't talk to you doesn't mean you're not going to exist and I will never, not be able to make you exist. Right. So I just think in that sense, 
everyone just for you know being exposed to the student body in its entirety should come. Okay, cool. Is there anything else that I didn't ask that I should have asked or that you want to say or anything on your mind that you just want to toss out there? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, what is your... Hmm, I'm interested to see what your answer is to this. What is you think the... I want to hear your first and second most prioritized issues you think affecting society are today. Because I feel like your first might be a bit more um, obvious when I was going to ask the question, but I'm curious what your others would well, be. By society, you mean the U.S.? U.S. society. Yeah, let's go there. Uh, what do I think the top issues affecting society in the U.S. are? Um, right, how many did you say? Two? I'm going to give. Yeah, I wanted to hear two because I was curious how related the two would be. Um. The turn away from liberal values and that manifests itself in terms of polarization, division, etc. And I think the second one, and when you say U.S., I assume you mean U.S. domestic issues. Yes. Yeah, I, I, I think it's um, homelessness and associated issues to homelessness, income disparities, drug addictions, etc. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that, those are my, my, my top two. But the turning away from liberal values and all that entails, the ripping down the statues, the, the whole, it's all in that suite of, of, mm -hmm. of issues. What do you think of that? Um, of your answer, I did think it was interesting that you had very different answers, meaning, you know, when you discuss homelessness and all that entails versus uh, how society leans politically and an ideology against or straying away from liberal values. I thought it was interesting that those were, despite their difference in scope, pretty much as of equal importance to you. Um, something I did want to note that you would probably find interesting is, so do you see that building right there? Yeah. The one with yeah. all the different with arches? The globe? Yes, with right. the globe. Um, so that building is actually now called the Center for Public Affairs. It was just renamed and previously it was named the Von Kleinsmann Center. And during the, um, the beginning of COVID, the name actually got changed due to public outcry because of the association with um, eugenicism that the um, former person it was named after was associated with. Um, so that was, I mean, because I was just trying to think like regarding like, you know, taking down statues, these things we ha see happen at universities. I don't think there's much to that similar extent that really happens here. Honestly, from my perspective, USC, especially within California, is a rather moderate campus overall. And I think it's because there's such a balance between the school of business leaning more conservatively yeah. than the CAC school okay. of medicine. So, so let, me, let me, when I say liberalism, I don't mean like Democrat liberal. I mean broadly enlightenment values liberalism, freedom mm -hmm. of speech, freedom of yeah. press, freedom of assembly, things yeah. like that, due process, the equality under the law that kind of thing. And then people think that that's not worth valuing anymore. Okay, so then follow up question, like, um, I guess regarding like political leaning and how it associates with liberal values in that sense, would you say progressivism um, is, I guess, I, going against those values, yes. like leaning towards sense? Yeah, it's a repudiation of the enlightenment. Okay, Correct. okay. Got it, understood. Um, yeah, forgive me if any of the terminologies I'm a little bit. Oh no, no, with. It's, it's just it's it's turning away from those values of free speech, etc. It yes. and it's using tradition, traditional, like the the academy, etc., to push a very specific agenda, as opposed to giving students the best representative representatives of various voices, and mm -hmm. then letting them decide which is, you know, which is more persuasive to them or, yeah. What, yeah. One thing you just kind of sparked in my, I guess, mind thinking about that is I think something that could sway USC or at least administration in that, it's just the amount of scandal USC has had, you know, regarding its administration. And so doing what seems morally or ethically righteous after that regarding things like equity and Title IX, I think, um, I don't necessarily know if I can speak for how that would relate to um, censorship and those types of like practical implementations, but I do think that 
regarding censorship for doing what's seen as right by society at USC at least has been very much affected by past scandal whether the elitism associated with an admission scandal or whether you know the sexism and the harassment associated with our Keck Medical School in the past when we had that you know I think we were just finishing the lawsuit um, with one of the former physicians through Keck um, so I think those definitely within the administration are still in mind, especially with who they're hiring um, and who is vocal in what they're saying on campus. All right, cool. I think, I think that's it. I actually had, I think, one more question. Oh, yeah. Um, Anything. Yeah, so maybe two. So my first question was how do you think COVID-19 specifically plays into this? Because I believe COVID-19, at least from my perspective, has turned from a medical health issue into a political one or into a theological one. Um, so I was just curious how you think that COVID-19 plays into this whole discussion of liberalism. Yeah, I mean. Enormously. But I'm, it's not that I'm afraid of giving you an answer, but it's that the answer that I would want to give would take more than five minutes. Got it. Neil Ferguson talks about in his book, it, it shouldn't be political, the historian. Um, yeah. it, it shouldn't be political. You should mask up or not on the basis of the best available evidence you should you have to let evidence lead the way mm -hmm. and the problem that's why i said for liberalism how it's been polarized how it's yeah. like so that's a problem that affects everything so i kind of cheated your question a little bit because yeah. i wanted to find something so broad that all these things could fall under it. Got it all right and what was the second question so it's so i can tell you later but it's just a yes. long answer no of course okay understand um my second question was if you had any advice for a student group like the moderator which you know our goal is just to allow for um, comfort in discomfort and just bringing people together whether they end up agreeing or not. I was wondering if you had any advice for a student group like us, um, you know, trying to bring together people, maybe moderate, maybe not, um, despite being in a society that, you know, I think kind of prioritizes niching those groups so that way they don't have to interact. Yeah, I have a one piece of advice yeah. and that let people know why it matters. Because mm -hmm. if people don't know why it matters, then you're just humming in the wind. And it will help you be explicit in articulating why it's important for you and then the people who come to the group meetings as well. And so the change, if you, we want to change the polarization, we have to let people know why it's important to talk across divides. Mm -hmm. If we don't do that, then people don't understand why they're there in the first place. Got it. So that would be my advice. Yeah. Cool. Thank you very much. I appreciate yeah. it. All right. Cool. Thank you. I think we're good. What brought you to this event today? I'm part of the moderator club here at uh, USC, founded by Jillian and uh, Lena. And I uh, just want to support free speech, freedom of thought, consciousness, uh, so on and so forth. And I'm looking to contribute, hopefully, to the conversation. But what are you expecting? Um, you know, I'm not entirely sure. I'm expecting some sort of, like, Q&A style thing. Um, where there's like a moderator asking people in the audience kind of like questions and kind of like their thoughts on important issues about, I think it's related to social justice. So um, not really sure what I'm expecting. Maybe some spicy moments, uh, but yeah. <laughs> um, so I'm just hoping to see some uh, pressing on campus issues and like student life issues brought up and hear people's thoughts on what's going on on campus. I'm expecting to see some debate about you know, the issues that are on campus right now. I want to observe where the fault lines are. Expecting uh, a flow, a uh, open environment where people can express their opinions without harsh scrutiny, criticism, or in today's terminology, canceling. Do you feel free to express your opinion about controversial subjects in the classroom? No, no, and no. <laughs> Definitely not. Can you tell me a bit more? Um, yeah, I mean, in my... I've only been here for a year, so I've only taken 10 classes so far. But, I mean, the, the environment at USC very much feels, in my experience at least, like there's a certain narrative. A lot of the professors have a, a certain narrative that the institution follows that they feel strongly about and, you know, that you're going to be a lot more academically successful if you fit into that narrative. And that's been my experience so far. As of right now, no, I, I don't feel comfortable expressing controversial opinions in class. Do you feel free to express your opinion about controversial subjects in the classroom? Yes, I absolutely do. In the classroom? I would say so. I feel like most of our professors are pretty welcoming. They do welcome diverse viewpoints. So, yeah. Everybody ready?
Yep. Awesome. We are thrilled to welcome you to tonight's reverse Q&A. I want to commend everyone in the audience, both in person and on our live stream, for choosing to be here. I know that midterms right now are taxing, and I can acknowledge that discussing social justice and free speech on campus is not our particularly easy task. But we at The Moderator believe it is important to involve all of us in these conversations in order to create unity and positive change. Typically, The Moderator goes about breaking down polarizing topics through weekly meetings, where we discuss three topics of varying significance. Through asking each other's questions about our opinions and experiences, we feel that we can bridge divides even in hard to have conversations. That is exactly what we plan on doing here tonight, but with some help from Peter Bogosian. Please welcome Peter Bogosian. Thanks, Jillian. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for coming. Thanks, Jillian. Thanks to the moderator and Anru Associates. Um, and I know that it's midterms and students getting students out of midterms is difficult, but I still, I, 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 I'm glad that people came and I'm looking forward to our conversation this evening. We're gonna uh, keep it brief tonight, so here's the structure of the event. We're gonna show a brief film. It's from uh, Travis Brown's film. There's Travis over there behind the camera. The Woke Reformation, we're gonna show episode one of that. Um, and then we're going to go into listening to students and listening to community members and listening to attorneys and listening to people talk in general about their experiences on campus. And then what I really want to do is I want to dig into what possible solutions to this are. Because everybody's asking questions and I interviewed people today and I have to say I was incredibly impressed with the people, with the students I met today. They were very chill, the vibe was great, they were very mature, nobody was freaking out. Um, so I knew this would be a good event. This is also the first event on an eight, eight university, college and university tour. And my hope with this event, and I think we can do this here, is we can have some really good conversations where we can dig down into some issues and be, talk sincerely and honestly about things. And so my hope is that that will help other people and other students. Okay, so without further ado, we're gonna play the film and then we'll start the event. When one is woke and can see and feel the oppression everywhere, it becomes one's moral duty to call it all out, ban it and deplatform, punish and cancel the perpetrators. The rest of us are at best still asleep or at worst willfully ignorant and refusing to wake up. The woke movement claims to be progressive but its origins are more than half a century old and based on faulty and unproven scholarship. Surely we can find a better and more modern basis for understanding the social issues of our day. I'm going to orient this toward around three specific questions. The first question, do you self-censor in the classroom? In other words, does this orthodoxy, maybe it's social justice, maybe it's another orthodoxy, um, does it dissuade you from voicing your opinion? Does anybody want to come up and you want to come up and, 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 and talk about your experiences with that? Did, yeah, did you have to raise your hand? Yeah. I have never felt the need to self-censor in the classroom at any point, whether my professor was a centrist law professor or a communist with pink hair, both of which were professors that I did have. The issue that comes with this type of debate is that you're focusing on college campuses. The one area that it will consistently overrepresent young people on the far left, most of which will assimilate into regular society and eventually probably just become progressive liberals, okay? That is not representative of the population as a whole in any way. In the electorate, you will run into tens of millions of people on the far right. There is almost no one in the US, probably under 5% of the country that is on the far left. All right, so the distortion of the debate here of focusing on wokeness, the reason that it always is brought up in the context of college campuses, especially in the op-ed page of the New York Times, is because these are the few places where this actually exists. It's not a real problem outside of the internet where online cancel culture can be an issue due to how mobs work and then the algorithm, et cetera. But in terms of actual political discourse, 
All of the suppression we're seeing is actually coming from the far right. You'll notice the don't say gay bill. They're trying to suppress discourse about LGBTQ issues. And these teachers are not talking about sex. They're just mentioning the fact that they got married to another man and then basically being forced out of the classroom or being shown a hostile environment that eventually makes them leave. So the real issue in America with political discourse is not really the far left. To be frank, they're quite irrelevant. The issue is the far right, and they don't show up as much on college campuses because they don't have a large presence here, but they do have a presence here, and they have a massive presence in the country as a whole. The ultra-woke, as they're called, are annoying. They are not a threat. The threat comes from the far right, and they are actively trying to end liberal democracy in the United States, and I think we should focus more on them as an issue. Right. Well, thanks. I'm, I'm actually very happy. I appreciate that. I'm, I'm also very happy to talk about the, the, the far right in context. Um, and I really appreciate you coming down here and saying that, so thank you. At one point, I'd like to, I don't, I don't mean to bush, bushwhack you, John, but I'd like to pull you down here and get, get your... Yeah, I'd love to, I don't mean to bushwhack you, but if you have a comment about something, because uh, I think that, that listening to your opinion about, about that. So yes, my name is uh, John Wood Jr. I'm national ambassador for an organization called Braver Angels, and Braver Angels is America's largest grassroots bipartisan organization dedicated to the work of political depolarization. I think that my reflection on Christian's comments very quickly is, first of all, extremely thoughtful, right? And... Um, I think intellectually serious and what I would want to perhaps put forward is what I could imagine sort of a good faith rebuttal being to aspects of the the um, the, the comments that were rendered here. Um, I think that Christian makes the case that the larger phenomenon of wokeism and cancel culture is overblown, that it is localized in the context of college campuses, uh, which are not representative of the general population, and therefore the sorts of social phenomenon that people are worried about is something that's not reflective of the larger kind of problems facing society, whereas the illiberal tendencies of the far right are more widely distributed in American society. I think that you would have some folks who would respond by saying that Campuses and universities occupy a unique point of social and institutional leverage in American society because those who are educated on college campuses then go to populate our institutions across society, right? And so that the norms set forth on campus life become the norms of corporations, become the norms of government, become the norms um, of, of the law, of the field of, of, the field of, um, of um, litigation, etc., uh, and journalism, for that matter. And that, therefore, we have to look at the influence that comes from college campuses as existing in sort of a different level of significance as it filters out into society. And Travis Brown's, uh, Mr. Brown's uh, video kind of paints that picture a little bit when it talks about the norms of wokeism populating the discourse, broadly speaking. Um, I think that you would likely have people in the sort of conservative mainstream of society, look at the entertainment industry as, and in agreeing probably with Christian's point that left leftist ideology or you know whatever you want to call it, wokeism, um, is something that's not necessarily representative of the American mainstream, but that's also sort of the point that many conservatives and Republicans make which is that it is the leverage of this perspective as it shows up, let's say, in popular culture, in the entertainment industry, through the vehicle of Hollywood, that makes it appear to have an outsized influence that is, in fact, being sort of imposed on mainstream society through something of an artificial megaphone. And so you can look at sort of certain examples of this. For, exa for instance, in general, uh, well, there's... And I don't know how prevalent this is on college campuses in particular, but I do know that disproportionately speaking, a larger percentage of campus and university educated um, Latinos or Hispanics will use the term Latinx 
as a way of identifying themselves and their identity. If you pull the broad population of Latinos, uh, that percentage stands at about 3% of the general Latino or Hispanic or Latinx population. 6%? Okay. But even at 6%, it represents a, a marginal percentage within the overall kind of spectrum of identifications in that population, but achieves a wider sort of enunciation on college campuses. Well, in, in sort of a similar vein, you look at Latino voting patterns uh, across the country, and you find that where the Hispanic population draws closest to the border, if I understand correctly, they tend to be more likely to vote Republican, and yet a certain sort of stance on immigration policy as an issue tends to be sort of in a blanketed way ascribed to the Latino population in general. Now, I'm, I'm giving you perspectives that I think would be likely responses from a mainstream, sort of somewhat educated conservative or Republican uh, perspective. I have my own personal view about about these issues. Um, one, one, one final uh, example, the African-American community, I think generally speaking in polling, indicate a larger sort of desire for sufficient policing in at-risk inner city communities across the country. Um, but if you are tracking the sort of thrust of, particularly during the summer of protests following the death of George Floyd, some campus-based activity, some media chatter sort of revolving around the defunding of local law enforcement as a means of protecting black lives, you might come away with the impression, and this is something that mainstream Democratic politicians uh, have been very much uh, concerned about, um, that defunding the police was sort of a mainstream position within the African-American community, whereas that's not necessarily the case. And yet, in proportion to the number of people who have it, that position seemed to have gained a strong traction in the institutional settings that set the larger tone of discourse in American society. So I think that my sense, Christian, is that you make a compelling case that as you go to sort of the next level of that conversation with folks who are coming from the other side of the ideological spectrum, what you would want to confront is this concept of outsized influence surrounding a certain perspective in ways that do have real impact on society at large. So that's an off the top of my head response to your very thoughtful and, and, and well, well-grounded comments. Yeah. What role in your education do you think conversation should play about race, gender, sexual orientation, et cetera? Do you think that that should play a role as appropriate to the discipline? Do you think that that should play no role? Do you think that that should play a kind of a North Star to the way that one conceives the discipline? I just throw that out there because when I go around and talk to students, we get some very different opinions about that. But anybody have any thoughts on that? One of the big things I think is like, you have to celebrate diversity, and I mean that among, among, among diversity of thought. So I think that one thing that's so special here is we have a lot of talented professors, and it's great for them all to have their own ways of teaching it, whether it should be taught that way or shouldn't. I think that th those kind of conversations should be discussed with different types of people, because if every kind of discussion you have about this is the same, you're not really going to learn and, anything. And do you have that here? I believe I have found that here. Not maybe not as much so about um maybe not as much so about gender but i feel like i didn't take g's that were more geared towards that i feel like i took some yeah maybe a little bit but for me it was a lot of i i geared myself heavily towards in those g's philo philosophy and uh life and that kind of stuff and um and that, I feel like that was very well represented and I got to have those discussions with many different types of people and I learned a lot from both sides. And I think that that should also be represented in the gender thing. And, and like I was saying, I think it would be an, not easy, but it would be difficult for the professors, but I think it would be an easy idea to integrate into each of these classes for what they are. I have to say, this is, I mean, my, my take on this is this is incredibly encouraging to me. When I talk to the students and I listen to the ideas that were uh, uh, spoken about really gives me a lot of hope. I think that's just extraordinary. It's wonderful. Question for Jillian. When you were writing about um, and researching about obesity, would you have been comfortable to discuss individual responsibility in one's own health and, you know, and if they are obese? and where their, where their individual responsibilities stand. I felt comfortable researching it in that class. 
I don't know if in my upper division case studies class, which is global health case studies, would I feel it was pertinent information to mention. But I think that just kind of, you know, feeling the room and recognizing the nuance of, you know, I love my major because we focus on equity. I love that that's something we do. But then if I want to question it in any way or question um, those individualist components, you know, I'm more than free to take a different class to talk about it. So in that class, I felt like I could. Um, I don't know if it just would have been as appropriate in other classes, but other classes have different subjects. So I hope that answers your question. If you look at the USC GOP, the USC College Republicans, they basically forced out their last president for not being sufficiently supportive of Donald Trump in the 2020 election. His name's Jack. They literally told him they had the votes to impeach him and kick him out as president because he was not sufficiently supportive of Donald Trump for them. Attack on democracy is not coming from the Democratic Party. It's not even really coming from the left wing. It is coming from the far right, which has control of the Republican Party because Republican base voters are extremely far to the right and nationalistic and are trapped in a media environment that has created a far right echo chamber using Facebook, Fox News, and other pieces of media within that ecosystem. And that is the threat that American democracy faces, not the far left. And to conflate the two is a false equivalency and shows neutrality bias because it's not objective. When I first came here as a freshman, um, it was during, so 2019 spring, it was during like, you know, um, the election and everything. Uh, and I was walking and I see on the ground, people wrote in shock, Bernie Sanders 2020. Right. So I see that, you know, I walk next day. I see it there. It's still there. Next day. It's still there. I want to ask you, what do you think would have happened if I put down and I'm not saying this how I think, but or this who how I vote or anything. What if I wrote down Trump 2020 next to it? And now, no, no, no wait one second. I'm um, sorry. Um, but on top of that, don't you think that there's also a level of uh, social outcasting? when it comes to right thinking ideas, especially when you display that. I mean, if I displayed on my story on Instagram, Trump 2020, I would have had 10 people, 15 people, 100 people on follow me, all from college, all people that know me. I've had arguments because uh, I, I do lean Republican and I've had arguments where I'll argue with a kid um, who's, who's on the left and they will go around and tell people, oh, Matthias, Blah, blah, blah. Like they'll, they'll say, they'll say things about me. They'll make generalizations on the way I think. And I don't, I agree with, I'm, I am, um, pro choice. So I'm on you on that side, but they would go around and say, oh, he probably thinks, uh, pro life. He's probably against abortion and everything like that. So you, you s make all these claims that there's, uh, there's, there's the, the censorship is really coming from the far right. And in no way am I the far right, but even if I display a slight, rightist idea on campus and this discussion I was on campus so I don't want to bring it back to America um, I would get politically outcast for displaying my own beliefs I would definitely say on campus there's definitely a bigger shift and maybe it's a generational thing um, maybe it's with social media I would definitely say that ties into it but there definitely is I would say if someone came out as conservative in my class and actively made it known that they made for voted for Trump in 2020 that they would get backlash dirty looks maybe even like some commentary um, from other peers. You have a valid, both of you have a valid point about social backlash. That's not censorship. And then also this backlash to social views you find disfavorable, that's a thing. It's a thing in the other direction too. You go to a rural red Republican area and you're a liberal and you start posting a whole bunch of liberal viewpoints, you're going to face backlash as well. I definitely do agree with the fact that, um, you know, social backlash is present on both sides, not just on the left. Like, yes, if you were to, you know, write Trump 2020 on the sidewalk, yeah, I might, um, you might get backlash for that because we are in uh, one of the most diverse, if not the most diverse city in um, the states. Uh, but, you know, um, he was right, you know, and I, I think that kind of goes back to your first question. Um, do you feel free to voice your own opinion in class? Um, in this particular, and in, in my personal experience, um, I do kind of, I do have views that are kind, do align with, you know, the overall, like, 
um, views of a diverse body as we do have here at USC. So I personally don't feel, um, you know, afraid to as a conservative person would. But then again, I go to USC in Los Angeles and not a school in Texas. So what I've been super impressed with everybody. I've been I've been genuinely impressed with everybody's ability to engage and and speak. And I appreciate that. It's been a Oh, am I good for this mic? Yeah, it's been interesting. I've learned I've it's it's been a um somewhat of a renewal of my hope in what's possible with mature, thoughtful people. And so I'm 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 sincerely appreciative of of the way that the di the the disputes and the dialogue was handled and I think that's that exactly what we should be doing in a civil society and that's i agree that's how we move forward and okay so i want to conclude tonight by uh thanking everybody for coming thanking everybody for the conversation we're going to have a, a very quick wrap up uh by our hosts for a little exit Let's interview do it. Let's do it. all righty what did you think about the event I thought it was really great. I think we had a lot of conversations. Um, a lot of them were productive. I like that for the first time ever, I heard a lot of conservative leading views as opposed to democratic leading views. We're in Los Angeles and at USC specifically, we tend to have a you know a very democratic leading school, which is great. And I thought it was really interesting to hear from the other side for once and kind of hear where they were all coming from. So I think that we had a lot of great productive answers, a lot of great productive discussions. Everyone's very well spoken. I will say that as well. So that was just in general, just my opinion of it. I just thought it was it was really. I I, I haven't done something like this in a long time, and I, I found it very enlightening, and fascinating, and and it was just very enjoyable. I think it went really well. I'm really proud about how everything turned out. Um, I was told it would be a bit more chiller vibe because I feel like USC, especially compared to a lot of other schools, it's not as like. I feel like socially turmoil. However, and also from being president the moderator and seeing the club grow, we really haven't had too many like, you know, more heated discussions, but today was a bit more heated than I was expecting. But honestly, I still really liked what everyone had to say. I really liked hearing everyone's perspectives and opinions and everyone really, I feel like embodied the true spirit of our club by attending this like reverse Q&A. All right, what did you think about this event? I thought it was terrific, man. Uh, anytime you can see uh, students actively engaged, listening to each other, you know, and being able to sort of absorb the differences that exist between them on issues that actually matter, that they feel passionately about, while still being able to sustain an intellectual argument that doesn't devolve to ad hominem, they're already doing a hell of a lot better than most of our pundits and politicians. So I thought it was beautiful. I thought this was a fabulous event. I was super curious about the format going in. I'd never heard of a, of a reverse Q&A before. What is that? Yeah. Um, but I thought Peter did a really artful job of, of stringing together the various comments that were shared. And there was a pretty diverse array of views present. I liked that. Uh, I thought the event went well overall and had respectful discourse. I thought the video was a little bit reductive. Um, I mean, it was immaculately produced and had some ideas that I really agreed with. Um, but I thought actually one of the students here issued an interesting rebuttal and, and his, his response was basically like flattening the conflict today to just wokeness versus anti-wokeness is, is a little too simple. Uh, and I appreciated, I appreciated where he was coming from, even if, like I said, I, I did respect the perspective of the video. I loved the video. Um, mainly because I have experience with Foucault's work. I think it was very interesting um, and I thought it was satirical, so I thought they were trying to make a way bigger message than I think what was actually presented, and I thought it was super funny. I was laughing through the video because I was like, because because they were talking about woke and this like how p people are very like superiority complex because they believe they're so woke, and it's not it's not as simple as being woke or being unwoke, and there's this whole spectrum of beliefs that go into being woke or even just practicing that and implementing that into your life and i think that's what the video was trying to say like it's not just woke or unwoke and so i thought it was really great and i thought i really liked the mention of um power and how that influences everything that we think in life and I, like it's very prevalent and i don't think people think about that often 
Yeah, so are you saying that you, because uh, I saw your reaction with a video, and I, I heard you just say, like, it seemed, uh, like, almost rhetorical, or? Yeah, like, I think that they were kind of, they were calling up, they were calling out the people who, like, pick out every little thing and say that this is wrong or this is wrong, taking apart pieces of words, taking apart Twitter quotes, cancel culture, and all of these things that mainstream pop culture uses to, like, make themselves say that we are greater than we're instituting change and i think that it was calling that out a little bit because i think that when you start calling people out and you start saying you're wrong how are you any different than them because they're just saying you're wrong too based on their ideology and their beliefs so like who's actually right and who gets to decide who's actually right we can't really it's just you believe one thing or the other but there's no right because who gets to decide that i thought the video placed far too much importance on the salience of uh, wokeness and cancel culture um, on college campuses, when in reality, among the mainstream public opinion and the mainstream electorate of the United States, it's really not that big of an issue compared to the illiberalism of the far right that's taking over the Republican Party. Feel like you learned anything from this event? Definitely. I think that I learned um, specifically a lot more about, you know, left-leaning policies. Like, I really liked the policy, or not the policy, the specific thing that was said that, the example that was given that was discussing, you know, like, if you were a Democrat in Texas, for example, you would have a lot of people hating on those opposing views as well. And it kind of gave me some perspective about, like, being a conservative in Los Angeles. And, you know, you, you, you feel like your views aren't as heard when in actuality... It's just that you're in a place that's more democratic leaning. Just like when you, if you're a Democrat in Texas, you would have the exact same, you know, situation happen to you. So I thought it was really interesting to hear that perspective just because, you know, it just gave me more perspective on that. And that in actuality, like the entire United States has this going on. It's not just, you know, towards the Republican Party. This is also towards the Democrat Party in other parts of the United States. I think first I learned how to disagree with people in my own head and not like express because sometimes I think I talk a little bit too much and not listen to people. So I talked a lot to, I let people talk this time, I guess. And I think that I saw a clear division of like people who've experienced different walks of life and really ha how that's like impacted them because I can like tell the difference between the guys who talked and all of their interesting perspectives. So it was really interesting to pick up on that. Cause like, I think that I get into this own narrative that USC is a predominantly white school and that there's a lot of white narratives that get taught into our classes so i think it was interesting to see that other people have had such diverse experiences and how it's like led them to have their own opinions and thoughts it's been it was interesting i'm going to be chewing on what i what i saw here today for a while i'm really curious about taking this format into some other settings and seeing how we can apply this this radical listening and, and radical community sharing model to maybe some other you know, settings and other conflicts potentially. I think that some of the facts thrown out, I was a little bit surprised by just because there were some things said that weren't necessarily true just because I'm a part of some clubs that some people made statements about. So to be fair, like some things were a little bit misrepresented. I would say it was when it came to facts, um, specifically like the GOP president, you know, just he was ousted out when that actually didn't happen. And I know the previous GOP president. That's why I also know the Democratic Party president. So, you know, I was kind of involved with both sides, just getting to know that. So that's just like, it, that was a little bit surprising. Okay, so at USC, we have a diversity requirement within all the categories. You can fulfill it with any category ranging from A to H. I fulfilled mine with a category B. It was like a history class. It was HIST 100, which is like the American experience. And it was like history from like, not like the typical like textbook lens like how would you inter how would a textbook interpret this like how are you being taught this and I feel like the even though we are required to take these classes and all the I do have my own complaints with the G system it was really refreshing to like see like the sentiment of like oh like the way that like all these topics are being discussed like it actually does make a difference on our campus and being able to like have these conversations okay awesome I'm sure there's something that we can do to improve is there is there some way we can make it better Somehow? Uh, if there's a way to, a lot of students, I think, are would love to say something, because I had some conversations after that were excellent, but they're a little bit embarrassed. I, you know, a lot of people have that, that stage fright, the fear of 
talking in public. Ryan, cameras and microphones, maybe? Cameras and microphones. And what are people going to say? Remember the first question about, in, would you say something in, in your class? And a lot, a lot of students would love to, but they're afraid about how they're going to be viewed and, and, and judged. Mm. And I don't know how you can overcome some of that, but that would be nice. And if, how can we improve? Um, I think we have to be a little bit more strict about the way people are answering questions. I think people went on for a really long time, and I think it did prevent, like, a lot of people from being able to talk. Um, I think, you know, there's also a lot of discourse back and forth between parties, so I think that limited a lot of conversation. And um, so I think there should be a way to, I guess, moderate as per our club. Um, but yeah. Okay, awesome. Um, were you surprised by anything you heard tonight? Mm, that's a good question. Was I surprised by anything that I heard tonight? Um, candidly, I was surprised to find any conservatives on campus at all because, of course, there's this myth that there's there's no conservatives on any college campus. And I've certainly bought into that for myself, and I was really heartened to see that there are some and that the ones that are here are willing to speak. I thought that was cool.